this time on The Gadget Show. Go! Ah! I turn Otis's world upside down. Yeah! Then turn it the right way up. And then turn it upside down again. As we test this summer's best roller coasters and roller coaster simulators. I discover some very useful and enjoyable USB gadgets. Woo! And we show you some amazing biometric technology from the States that can tell who you are from 15 paces. You have been identified. Welcome to The Gadget Show. Yep, this week's challenge is all about trying to find out the most exciting and terrifying roller coasters in the UK. This summer, loads of you will be spending at least a day flying around upside down, trying to keep your food down and perhaps squealing like a pig. But which would be the roller coaster that would leave you wishing you bought yourself a spare pair of trousers? Yes. Now, for this challenge, we need two people, OK? Uh, the first would be the guinea pig, the person who's not easily scared, to go on the roller coasters uh, and experience the rides. Then we need a scientific type. Someone to take the data down and judge objectively just how scared or exciting the coasters were. Yeah. I was having my perm done that week, <laughs> so it was down to these two. And I really don't like roller coasters. I don't like the way they make my stomach feel. I don't like what they do to my heart. I am honestly not a fan. So clearly, I did the analysis and he did the roller coasting. <laughs> Roller coasters use carefully placed visual cues and extreme engineering to make you feel as though your life is hanging in the balance, even though you're actually perfectly safe. But which ride gives you the ultimate thrill and why? To find out, I've chosen three roller coasters, yeah! each with a different method of scaring your pants off. Otis will ride all of them to find out which is the most thrilling. <laughs> To measure his fear, we would take before and after readings of his blood for levels of adrenaline. The needle is in my arm. His heart rate, using this rather cool portable ECG machine called the Vital Jacket, and last but not least, the pressure of his grip to see to what extent these white knuckle rides live up to their reputations. After he's ridden all three roller coasters, I'll look at his results and analyse his raw, pounding terror. Hi, Otis! <gasps> Sucker! He wouldn't be so cocky when he saw my first choice, Stealth. Found at Thorpe Park, it's the UK's fastest roller coaster, reaching 80 miles an hour in just 2.3 seconds. Thanks to compressed nitrogen boosters. I'm really not happy about this. You can't actually feel speed if you're moving at a constant rate, even at 80 miles an hour. But what it can feel is acceleration. And what he just felt was four and a half Gs of it. As well as that G-force, Stealth dishes out a healthy dose of airtime at the top, where the forces of gravity and acceleration cancel each other out and make you feel like you're weightless. Scream, boy, scream! I never want to do that again! Well, you won't have to, Otis, not until you've had your blood taken, your data downloaded and driven to Alton Towers, where your next roller coaster awaits. Air. Air is an inverted roller coaster, which basically means that the train doesn't travel on the tracks. Instead, it hangs underneath, and the passengers are carried in a prone position to make them feel like they're flying. Nice. OK, ready? Eh? Oh, wow! No one said anything about being a superhero! Yeah! Air might not be as tall as stealth, but in some places it's merely metres from the ground. Hey! All right! Wow! Yeah! Yeah! But where stealth's thrill lay in making Otis feel the speed through acceleration, Air has a few different tricks up its sleeve. Hey! All right! Wow! And then we're back! Air is all about visual cues, so the surroundings rushing past him at a rate to make his eyes water are literally just a few feet away. And every time he turns, he feels as though he's going to be smashed into the ground. 
Yeah. Yeah! This ride also has two total inversions. That is, upside-down bits, which aim to give you a thrill through the sheer unnatural force upon your body. And where stealth lasted less than 30 seconds, Otis's ride on air lasted for a total of one and a half minutes. I felt like Banana Man. He flies. But after my blood and data were collected, there was still one more ride to go. And it was a big one. Our final contender was Apocalypse at Drayton Manor, which hoists you up a 54-metre tower at a buttock-clenchingly slow rate. Really don't want to do this, man. Apocalypse also tilts you forward by 15 degrees, so you get a nice clear view of the ground below. Ah, oh, tipping forward, great. And that fools the mind into thinking your life is literally hanging in the balance. Being suspended 54 metres in the air with nothing beneath you is just not natural. Oh. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <sighs> the drop takes just four seconds, but experiences acceleration of a massive four Gs. <gasps> Oh, Susie, that was horrible. That was so horrible. Can you get me out of this, please? Fortunately for Otis, I soon received his data safe and sound for analysis. His pressure sensor had recorded his strongest grip on each ride. <gasps> I don't think you like that. The vital jacket had stored his heart rate to SD card, and it was simply a matter of uploading it to my laptop. Look at that, 163. That's amazing. His resting adrenaline levels were pretty average, but on one ride they increased by almost 1,500%. But was that enough fear to claim the title of scariest ride? Hey, thank well you very, done. Thank you very much, but I, I hated that you final ride pocket. I could tell. Come I'm and have a look it. at the results. We've got the heart rate, grip and adrenaline. So here's uh, Otis resting. It's about 60 beats per minute. A Little bit of adrenaline, and obviously that's where he's gripping. No grip there, floppy hands. The <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so the first roller coaster was called Stealth, and it did look horrible, didn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And you can see here that the heart rate hit 140 beats per minute. There was a wow. modicum of enjoyment with Stealth. I didn't, I didn't hate it. Now, air, the adrenaline is actually less on the air than it was at his standing rate. <laughs> Amazing, but the big one for me was the apocalypse because that was sheer genuine terror on there. Wasn't no it? question, yeah. I I hated it with a passion. And look at that adrenaline; it is literally going off the page. It, it absolutely is. I think it's unequivocal that the, uh, as far as the gadget show is uh, concerned, apocalypse is Britain's scariest ride. Welcome back. Now I want to talk to you about lawn mowers. Just recently, there have been some big advances in lawn mowing technology. These days, it's no longer good enough just to mow your lawn. The big news in the mowing world is mulching. That's cutting and recutting the grass into tiny particles which can be spread back down into the lawn to act as fertiliser. It's good for the grass, it's good for the environment, and in its own way, it's deliciously techy. But as ever, the question remains, which of these new mulching mowers is the best? I've got three of the latest lawnmowers on the market. There's the entry-level Flymo Multimo 420XC. It has a powerful 1700 watt electric motor and three different cutting modes. Next, the mid-range John Deere JS63VC. This hardcore petrol mower is a dedicated mulcher, complete with heavy-duty Briggs & Stratton engine. Finally, we have the top-of-the-range Honda HRX 537VY, which has a roto-stop feature so you can power-drive the mower without the blades rotating. To test them, I headed to the highly prestigious Belfry Golf Course, four times home to the Ryder Cup. If they know about one thing here, well, it's golf. But if they know about two things here, it's golf and grass. They weren't crazy enough to let me loose on their pristine Ryder Cup course, but they did let me mow their pitch and putt. I'm going to cut this course to a height of 25 millimetres. That's the recommended height for the average British family lawn. I'll be testing handling, speed and the quality of cut. First up, the fly mow. OK, stopwatch ready. Good. Three, two, one, go! A simple lever dropped the flymo to the desired 25mm height and I was off and mulching in no time. 
It's got a 1700 watt electric motor. And there's this special mulching plug in the back which stops the grass coming out and sends it back through the blade for a finer cut. The three by six metre area was mulched in a minute 21 seconds and I could head off to test the Flymo's manoeuvrability. For this section I'd be collecting instead of mulching and I spent 20 seconds converting the Flymo. With the 50 litre box attached I was underway. In many ways the Flymo is highly manoeuvrable, it's very light and because there's a roller at the back in addition to the four wheels there's very little danger of you falling off your lawn into the flower bed so you can approach edges with confidence. On the negative side, though, you are always aware that you're connected to the power source by a cable. Stop. With an overall time of 2 minutes 23, it was on to the next mower, the John Deere. Three, two, one, go! And using the lever by the wheel to choose the correct one of seven different cutting heights, I was underway within seconds. The underneath of that deep domed deck is completely smooth to blow the nitrogen-rich cuttings back onto the lawn below. And as it's a dedicated mulcher, after just a minute I could head straight on to cut the hole. The John Deere's Piesta Resistance, though, is this pair of casters at the front. You can lock them for straight line mowing, then unlock them with this lever on the handlebars for extra manoeuvrability when it comes to the twisty bits. Thanks to its super manoeuvrability, I was done in a minute 52 seconds. And stop. Time for the final mower, the Honda. Go! For the Honda, getting the blades to the required 25mm height meant adjusting a lever at each wheel, so I was slower to get underway. But once on the move, I was able to use the Honda's Versamo system. I can control the proportion of cuttings converted into mulch with this lever down here, which is great because the ideal proportion varies according to the weather conditions, the length of the grass, all sorts of factors. Ideally, you should only mulch in dry conditions and only take the very top off the grass for the best results. After 49 seconds, I switched to collection mode and moved on to stage two. Controls on the Honda are very easy to use. I like the throttles and the power drive that you operate with your thumbs. It feels very well balanced, like a well designed car. And the ease of handling brought me round the hole in just 1 minute 36. And stop! So, with a clear 16 second difference, the Honda's the easiest to use. But what about the quality of the cut? Well, I took the mowers to a botanical garden in Birmingham, where they'd let the grass grow for a couple of weeks to test them further. They all made a clear difference to their patch of lawn, but with the help of one of the garden's professional lawnsmen, I checked out just how good a job they'd done. So, Phil, what do you think of the Flymo's cut? Uh, Flymo did pretty well, really. Um, it's got quite a uniform, even cut. Yeah. Um, it's, it looks quite good. The finish is not too bad. Um, it did leave a little bit of residue from the mulching in places, uh, mainly along the wheels. Uh, but generally, even in the long areas of grass, it did pretty well. The, the Honda left quite a good clean cut. As you can see, uh, on the shorter areas of grass, there wasn't much residue at all. Unfortunately, when it did hit the longer grass, uh, it struggled slightly. As a result, it's left uh, some debris on the grass. The John Deere, it did pretty well again. Yeah. Quite an even cut, not as good as the Honda in my opinion. In terms of the mulching, uh, it's done really well. It hasn't left a lot of residue on top of the uh, surface of the grass. So, which was the best overall? Well, despite the excess mulch caused by the wet grass, it was the Honda that offered the most even and the quickest cut. Now, I think it's fair to say that you look like a man, John, that's mown a few lawns in your time. I really enjoyed using these. It was fantastic fun. Yes, mm. you look like you're having fun. OK, mm. then G ratings. Shall we start with the Flymo? Yes, and three Gs for the Flymo. Very healthy three Gs at that, because it's very good value for money, and it did a really good job of the mulching and mowing. Though it is a bit awkward having that cable It's a bit the restrictive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. OK, what about the John Deere, then? Well, another very healthy three Gs for the John Deere, because it is a very professional bit of kit, and and uh, it's very good as a dedicated mulcher. Also, it's very manoeuvrable, though it didn't actually manage quite the excellence of cut that the Honda did. Oh, OK. How many Gs for the Honda, then? Well, I was tempted to give it five Gs, actually, but uh, I'm only going to give it four because it is very expensive. And unlike the Flymo, actually, it doesn't have any sort of roller at the back, so you can easily fall off the edge <gasps> of the lawn. No roller, no stripes. What's more, it is a very well-engineered bit of kit. It's sort of lawn where you could really cover it, actually. And that's why the Honda is the Gadget Show's favourite mulching lawnmower. 
Each week on the Wall of Fame, Otis and I choose a particular gadget category, then we select one gadget from that category which we each feel confident about representing. Then, in our own unique way, we put a case across for each gadget, but which gadget ends up on the Wall of Fame is decided by Judge John Bentley. And this week, it's all about stuff that runs on tracks you can lay all over your living room floor. So, which should go on the Wall of Fame? Is it Scalextric or Hornby? This isn't a toy or just a hobby. It's a way of life, a job, a purpose. This isn't just a train set. It's a perfect example of pioneering virtual reality. I'm not Otis Dealing. I'm the station controller. Model railways have been made by loads of different companies, but in Britain, the best known is Hornby, which in 1938 produced the iconic 12-volt Hornby Dublo. Despite the fact that the little track is only 16.5 millimetres across and the trains are at a scale of 1 to 76.2, the detail is awesome. Here, the journey is just as important as the destination. OK, fair enough, the destination is exactly the same place as where your journey began, but in a world that's sick with instant fixes, this is the remedy. And you know what? It's remarkably addictive. Even today, Hornby sells over 100,000 sets a year and has a staggering 650 model range, which includes Harry Potter and Thomas the Tank Engine trains to keep the kids involved. And it's not just for kids. 70% of Hornby train sets are bought by adults, reliving the unbridled joy they experienced in their childhoods. So if you thought computer games killed the railway star, think again. The Hornby train set is a calming, beautifully engineered and generation-spanning way to escape the toils of the modern world. And it fully deserves a place on the Wall of Fame. Yeah, but the thing is, you see, I don't really want to escape the toils of the modern world. When I've got some free time, I want it to be adrenaline fueled. I want it to be an opportunity to pummel a mate into the dust. And I can do it on this. Scale X-Tree. It was invented in the 50s when toy maker Fred Francis got fed up chasing his clockwork cars around the kitchen floor. He fitted his cars with electric motors, built a rubber track for them to race around, and Scalextric was born. On its launch in 1957, Scalextric became an overnight sensation, and by 1961, it was the third best-selling toy behind Noddy. By 1968, slot car racing, as it became known, was so popular that it was being televised in America. Even Elvis had a room at Graceland dedicated to slot car racing. Before we go any further, I should perhaps remind you that the Gadget Show is the current world record holder for the fastest scale electric car. And when scaled up to full-size speed, our car reached a staggering 983 miles an hour. So how does it work? Well, this circuit is actually a circuit, literally. It's an electrical circuit. Underneath the car, there are two components. This piece of plastic, a guide blade, uh, its job is to keep the car on the track so that these two brushes can make contact and complete the circuit. If I grab my controller, I can control the amount of current that's flowing and therefore the speed of the engine. The more current, the faster the car goes. But the art of scale electric is applying just the right amount of power on the corners, as deftly demonstrated by myself. Go, go! These days, it's gone digital. Cars can swap lanes and properly overtake with up to six cars racing in a single slot. They can even drift around the corners and you can design your own perfect track using free downloadable design software. Do you know what? I honestly believe that every child, every adult child the world over deserves, in fact needs to have Scale Electric in their life. And for that reason, it must be on the wall of fame. I mean, these are both fantastically designed products with wonderful histories attached, and actually sort of deciding between them is going to be phenomenally difficult. Oh, God, it's the loving detail of that Hornby versus the excitement of the scale extra. But I've made my decision. Ultimately, it's a clear result. And... I'm going to come down on the side of the scale extra. Oh, yes! Because it's exciting. You've got the thrill of the race. And for that Great. reason, above all else, the scale oh. extra deserves its place on the Gadget Show's Wall of Fame. Welcome back. Now let's get straight on with part two of this week's big challenge, in which Otis and I have been given the job of trying to find the UK's scariest roller coaster rides. Yeah, Susie, you say Otis and I. Mm. You were indoors. 
with a hot cup of tea and a lab coat. And it was me that was outside jumping on some of the craziest machines ever created. Yes, we all play our part, Otis. So for the second part of the challenge, we wanted to find out if the latest roller coaster simulators could give us anywhere near as big a thrill as a real roller coaster ride. Roller coaster simulators cost around £65,000 compared to £12 million for the real roller coaster. But are they an exhilarating ride in their own right? Well, Otis has been a great guinea pig so far, so I've sent him on another mission to find out. Simulators are usually capsules like these, which use a combination of motion and vision to fool your brain into thinking you're moving at speed. Most simulators work using a motion platform and a clever setup of hydraulics. These hydraulics give it three degrees of motion. Heave, pitch, and roll. So, simulators need great visuals as well as accurate movement. I'd be testing Otis's reactions again to see how they compared with the real thing. And for this, I'd found two beauties. My first contender was the gargantuan Morphis Simulator, a 5-ton mega capsule with a 5.1 speaker surround sound, an HD projector and a 64-bit digital servo system controlling the hydraulics. Just like on the real roller coasters, I was wired up to record my body's reactions. The body senses changes in motion using fluid in the ear canals, which move tiny hairs inside. But when the hairs level out, you stop feeling the motion, and then you have to rely on visual cues. This means that by combining the right graphics with small movements, a simulator can trick you into thinking you're rattling along at speed. Oh, we, just <laughs> we just jumped across a gap where there was no track at all. Whoa! I suppose that emphasises the fact that the only limit to a ride like this is your imagination. <laughs> so you definitely feel that elevation when you're going up a slope as you would on a real roller coaster ride. But downhill sections weren't quite as convincing. I get a slight lurch in my stomach when we're going downhill, but not the same feeling you would when you're dropping. This feels real. We're on water now, and this is actually making me feel a little bit seasick. <laughs> This is quite nausea-inducing, this water bit. Oh. That was actually much better than I expected. The film and the movement of the ride work together really well to give you the sensation that you are really on a roller coaster ride. I didn't get the same lunging sensation that I would on the real thing, but Really, really good. While Otis was being transformed into a human colander in the name of gadgetry, I'd found another simulator which I thought could top the lot. This is the X2. It's quite a small simulator in comparison to the Morpheus or indeed a real roller coaster, but it's got some quite nifty tricks up its sleeve that I think Otis might like. The X2 includes what are known as 4D effects, physical effects like wind, heat and thunder. Oh, isn't she dinky? <laughs> He's got no idea. Scream for to go backwards! Bracing your face! Birmingham! Out onto the safety bar! Yes! Launching! Oh, wow! The journey on this one feels a whole lot quicker. Now, there are fans on board this one as well, so I get that... I get wind in my face. When there's an explosion, I can feel the vibrations through the seat. The X2 uses a 1200 watt car amplifier as well as two subwoofers attached to the seats for that roller coaster rumble. It's quite a bit hairier than the Morphids. And it was even more realistic. Okay, this is a massive climb. Do you know, I actually got a sense of the falling sensation there just a little bit. <sighs> It may be small, but size isn't everything. Hmm? That may be so, but the measurements would tell the real story. 
Oh. I really like that, because you know I'm a big fan of simulation, and, yeah. and actually, I thought the X2 was, was pretty impressive. You well, did. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, yeah. to try and compare the simulators to the real roller coaster that we tried earlier. I've got the test here. Can we have a look at the results, then, for the simulators? Again, we've got the heart rate, the grip and the adrenaline, as before, exactly yeah. the same. The resting heartbeat, 60 beats per minute on okay. average, so pretty good. Um, and look at the, the heart rate here on the Morpheus and the X2. You've got a heart rate of 82 on the Morpheus, and it went up to 100 on the X2. That's not bad, is it? I'm no. a little bit surprised at that. Yeah. Uh, but also, if you look at my adrenaline levels, they're incredibly low, and that was because I felt secure. But I think of all of the results here, the most interesting one is the grip here on the X2. <laughs> that is 14 pounds per square inch, and on the Apocalypse, it was 17. It's only just underneath when you were terrified. That's a white knuckle ride. The X2 really threw me about, and I wasn't strapped in. So yes, it was a white knuckle ride, and I must have changed seats at least three times while I was <laughs> on it. It bodes really well for simulation, and this is an area of roller coaster technology that's just going to get more and more scary. Yeah, yeah, good. Great stuff. It's time for this week's top five. And it's a top five that I had a lot of fun doing because it involved me sitting for hours in my favourite place, right in front of my computer, sticking all kinds of stuff into my USB slots. Built into every single computer, you'll find a number of universal serial bus or USB ports, which provide a gateway to a whole heap of peripheral gadgetry that takes advantage of this standardised socket. But as well as being the choice method for hooking up your MP3 player, your camera transferring files on the move. Its universal standard has given rise to a whole host of exotic peripherals. From the practical to the novel, through to the downright ridiculous. Almost anything can now be connected and powered via USB. So I spent an afternoon sifting through everything I could find to see what they offer. <laughs> and having given my USB ports a thorough workout, I had come to a decision on my top five USB peripherals. At five is the USB mini paper shredder and letter opener. OK, I admit it. This is a little bit of a novelty, but actually, it's got to be one of the most genuinely useful USB gadgets that I've seen. It's no good at big, thick documents, but it's great for receipts. And you can neatly open your mail using the envelope opener on the side. That's just brilliant. At four is the Ion Tape to PC Cassette Tape Archiver. If, like me, you've got a loft full of these, mixtapes. You may well want to enjoy those tracks on digital formats, but not know how to do it. Well, it's with one of these machines. Just pop in your tape, boot up the supplied software package and begin to record your chosen track. Once captured and tagged, the digital version of your old classics can then be listened to or transferred onto a portable media player. At three, it's the Digi Scribble, a portable digital note taker which saves you the job of typing up your handwritten notes. You click it to the top of your paper pad, press the go button, and then start to write. It receives and records movements made by the pen, storing your precious scribbles as you go. Job done. Then once back at your computer, you hook up the receiver by USB to reveal the results. Oh look, this is the Digi Scribble. Het instead of let's. Okay, my L's do look like H's. See if it understands my awful handwriting. It's really good! At two, it's the Ion VCR to PC USB videotape converter. How many old movies and home videos have you got that you can no longer watch because they're on VHS cassettes? Well, worry not, because this will convert them into digital files that you can play on your computer. It will capture your video at resolutions of up to 720 by 576, and once complete, the results speak for themselves. Isn't that just brilliant? The quality is fantastic. So simple. You plug into your computer, you press play, you click record, and job's done. The conversion software will also let you save stills, make simple edits and transfer footage onto a portable video device. And at number one, it's the Behringer IAX 393 USB electric guitar. Despite the authentic shape, single coil pickups and maple neck, it's the USB connector on the body that makes this guitar extra special. As you can plug it into any music making software package to record your best slash tribute. Woo! Absolutely awesome! Right, let's see what it sounds like. Yeah, that's brilliant! And all through a very simple USB interface. No, 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 no. 
like that. But the only thing is, of course, it doesn't matter how much technology you've got, it never makes up for zero talent. But I do think that that guitar in the hands of a, a, like a nine-year-old could actually produce the pop stars of the future. Yeah. I love it for that. However, this was my favourite, the tape deck. I mean, I've got thousands of tapes in the loft waiting to be converted to MP3, a digital format. Brilliant. Some great stuff. And, of course, while I was messing about with USB peripherals, I believe you're off to America on one of your tech trips. That's right. And uh, we're talking about the cutting edge, the very cutting edge of biometric technology here. Systems that can recognise you from distances of up to 13 and a half metres. In the world of establishing a person's ID, the big buzzword is biometrics. Fingerprints are the classic old-school biometric, but here in Carnegie Mellon's Scilab, they're taking one of the most advanced of all biometrics, iris recognition, mainstream. We're all familiar with iris detection devices from sci-fi movies. Here's a system that works now. And already, they're working on the next generation of iris and face detection. In this lab, Marios Savides and his team are working on a way to ID people using their irises. But unlike the standard system at the door, they're finding ways to identify people from a distance. What have you got going on here, Marios? Here we have an example of our, one of the modules that we're creating. And this is a commercial pan tilt zoom camera, that's what you're seeing up there. Uh -huh. And the purpose of that is, for example, imagine you walk into a high security building. Yes. Uh, this will do automatic face detection and tracking. While the computers and cameras they're using may be off the shelf numbers, it's the team's own high-end software that makes this system unique. It analyzes the image from the camera to find a face and then locks onto it. So what we're trying to do here is actually automatically detect the facial landmarks of a face. OK, so like nose, eyes, lips. Ah. Now, it may look like a dodgy cartoon, but these red lines are added by the software to indicate where the computer believes the human face to be. That's great. But locking onto a face is only the first step. To be able to check an ID from a distance, the system needs to be able to follow a face and zoom in on the iris. So the team have hooked their software up to a camera that can move. Oh, wow. That's actually... That camera is following... The camera's following my face as I move around. <laughs> and zooming, I can see the iris moving. Wow. So I can move left, right, up, down. It can also get you at distance, so... Really? I'm moving back, back now. Back. There we are, tracking me. Look at that. And it's still... got my face. And still it's zoomed tracking in. Me. It's got the still same resolution. Yeah, it has zoomed Starting right in. It's like, a, it's like a crazed fan, just fixed on me. The big step forward here has been to bring these separate innovations, facial landmark tracking and iris recognition, together. And to demonstrate the system, they digitised all my details into their database. So this is going to recognise my face, track my face, look at the features, recognize where my eyes are and then zoom in and then capture a high res of your iris for them for matching. Wow. Each person's irises are unique and as a form of ID they are even more reliable than fingerprints because they're much harder to damage. I can, I can see it. Oh, that's my eye, yeah! Wow! With the details of my iris captured and stored on the database, it was time to test out if Marios's system could ID me from across a room. You have been identified. In an instant, my face has been tracked, my eye located, my iris and therefore my identity verified, and all at a distance of 13.5 metres. In the future, this is a technology that will almost certainly be widely used in airports where the IDs of all passengers can be checked without them knowing. But think of the implications if this technology were operational on the 4 million CCTV cameras that watch our every move across the UK. Big Brother won't only be watching you, he'll know exactly who you are and where you are at all times. Scary. Welcome back.
let's get straight down to some tech construction. Yeah, this week's challenge involves Susie and Otis uh, trying to find the scariest and most exhilarating roller coaster rides in the UK, both real and simulated. And I think it's fair to say that along the way you found a few tips that the mm -hmm. designers of these things use to make them so terrifying. Exactly. So we wondered, knowing what we know, in true gadget show style, could we make our own simulator in my lounge? Our challenge was to recreate the feeling of this in a place like this. However, we probably couldn't fit all those struts and steel girders into my house, so we're going to do it all using the trickery of technology. The first step is to have some sort of visual that will recreate the views from your roller coaster. That will give you the sensation of height and speed, something I know quite a bit about, thanks to you. Yes, but we can do that here, right now, using computer-generated graphics. I've got my hands on this top roller coaster simulation program, No Limits. It allows you to build your own tracks using CAD, computer-aided design. It's used for technical drafts of real roller coasters and mimics real coaster behaviour. What about oh. that? 52 metres. That's very high. The more real it feels, the better. I've got a loop the loop here. Oh, for thank you. you. Thanks yeah. for that, yeah. And it's so simple. You can also add supports, scenery, all the things to make your roller coaster more realistic and more thrilling. Ah. You know what? It, it is really it's good. good, isn't it? But it's missing something. What do you mean? Well, that real sensation of motion. Now, I know we can't recreate the same forces that I had when I was on the roller coaster. Mm. But what if we had a seat that had the movement? Poking around the scrapyard found us the seat from an old Mondeo. We welded a car's drive shaft to a base plate to act as a pivot for the seat, then attached four springs to the corners and motorbike handles so that it could be steered in time with the graphics. Hey, that's not bad, Dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Steady on, hot shot. Right. Not finished yet, because we need to get that, that bowel trembling, sick inducing rumbling that you get, you know, when the roller coaster is hurtling down the tracks. Yeah. Yeah. I've come up with a real gem here, the Earthquake Quake Transducer. It's basically a very low-frequency speaker designed to give a vibrating boom effect to gaming chairs and home theatres. With a range of 5 to 40 hertz and 100 watts of power, it should give our roller coaster an incredible rumble. Do you feel it? Oh, yeah! Do you feel it in there? Right in there! Can I just put my hand there, just to...? Rinse in the basement! Oh, yeah. Hey, it's good, isn't it? On a ones and two South London crew! <laughs> Wiggle if you feel me! Wiggle if you feel me! It's good then, yeah? Yeah. Our roller coaster seat was a success, but with all that wobbling, we wouldn't be able to focus on the small screen of Susie's laptop. We needed something much more spectacular. Hey, Susie, what do you think? I think it's fair to say it's very large. Yeah, look. Yeah. 65 inches! This top-of-the-range Panasonic has a massive 60,000 to 1 contrast ratio and a colour range 120% higher than normal HDTV. We coupled it with a 5.1 speaker Logitech gaming sound system to give the sound of the roller coaster a realistic 3D feel. Susie, it's really good. Given the size of the screen, watching the action, I already feel nauseous. Yeah, but it's great for home theatre, but yeah. this test is supposed to be completely immersive. What you really feel like you're on a roller coaster. It's fairly obvious that this is just an old car seat, that's a big telly, and this is my front room. I think you need to wear a pair of these. The View 6 I wear are a pair of virtual display goggles with the equivalent of a 62-inch screen inside. This would cut off Otis's peripheral vision completely. I can see nothing but what's on the screens in front of me. Then that's a good thing. And I had one last idea to make it that bit more realistic. OK, are you ready, Otis? Set it off, Susie. OK, three, two, one, go! Oh, up we go. Going up, that's nice. Oh, this is always the bit where you know you can't get out. Oh, I can feel that a little bit, actually. Yeah. Cue the wind! What? Oh! <laughs> oh, wow! Susie, this isn't bad! Whoa! Oh, you're doing well back there! Woo! Even though I knew I was in Susie's living room, my senses were screaming otherwise. With the sound of the roller coaster in my ears, the rumble of the track beneath me, and seeing nothing but the drop ahead, it felt like the real thing. This is really good! Oh, Susie, you do do a good ride. Oh, thanks! <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what, Susie? That was 
actually really good. I can't believe it. We've made a roller coaster in my front room. Whoa! Yeah? yeah? Yeah, it's brilliant. It's very, very realistic. Hey, do you want to know what happened to your heartbeat when oh, you were yeah, on this? Oh, yeah, yeah, what happened? It went from 60 and it more than doubled to 121 beats per minute. That's really? Amazing. Really? Well, that means we succeeded then. You